And Dragon SpaceX, you are now merged with Tim Dodd. Dragon, please initiate a comm check, and once comm is confirmed, I'll let you know when to start the event. Tim, Dragon, comm check. Read you loud and clear. Welcome to Spacewalk, episode nine. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. And this is the Spacewalk podcast that I do where I'm literally out walking around. So you might hear stuff. Uh, it's a casual episode format where I just talk about whatever you guys have questions about. But this episode is extremely special because this is the first ever episode where I'm talking to people who have literally done a spacewalk. So uh, this is obviously the Polaris Dawn crew. I'm sure you've hopefully heard about this. It's uh, the second mission flown by Jared Isaacman, who funded and who did the Inspiration4 mission. Uh, this is the first of three Polaris missions. Very exciting. This is the first ever commercial spacewalk and all four members inside uh, of this mission that were inside the crew the uh, spacex crew dragon capsule did a spacewalk technically because they're all uh basically you know the, the entire vehicle was depressurized to vacuum so in a sense they all did but the, the two that went out were jared isaacman the mission commander and uh sarah gillis who is a mission specialist both of them actually left the hatch and did some maneuverability testing and a few different things that we talk about in this interview. And of course, we also have pilot uh, Scott kidd Petit on board as well as Anna Menon, who is also a mission specialist. And both of the women are SpaceX uh, employees and engineers, which is very exciting. So yeah, uh, this was the first time I've ever spoken to anybody while they're in space, which is a really big honor for me. So you're going to hear uh, us connecting. In real life, there's a pretty big delay uh, just with all the different like audio routing and internet stuff to be able to get it from point A to point B. So you will notice that uh, we trimmed it out a little bit just for brevity's sake. So uh, that's just a little note. Without further ado, let's talk to the crew of Polaris Dawn. Awesome. All right. Oh, well, thank you guys so much for taking a few minutes to talk with me here. Uh, this has been an exciting and incredible mission to uh to witness and watch along. I've been glued to my phone <laughs> the whole week. Uh, I want to start off with Jared. Uh, how has this mission compared uh, for you compared to Inspiration4? Has there been any big surprises compared to uh, your first space flight? Um, I think this mission has been like incredibly special uh, just as Inspiration4 was. Um, you know, it's two very different missions. Um, you know, we kind of packed our schedule on this one with um, a lot of science and research and a couple big objectives. But I'll, uh, I'll tell you, you know, going through them all and, and kind of checking off those boxes was, was just as emotional as it was on uh, Inspiration4 when we felt like we were, you know, getting the job done. I got to ask, with uh, the overview effect between uh, you and, and Sarah have had now a very unique perspective. I'd like to hear from both of you about, uh, was the overview effect any different when you're looking out of the, you know, the, the regular windows or even previously, again, from the cupola on Inspiration4 compared to actually having your head, st you know, leave the spacecraft and actually be out there? Is there a, is there a different sensation than, uh, than what you could experience previously? Yeah, Tim, I, I'd say that there was, um, it was surprisingly very different than looking through the cupola on Inspiration4. Um, it was uh, it was very intense. Uh, all of your senses uh, were kind of firing, and, and, and in a way, it was very overwhelming because um, with Inspiration4, you know, in the cupola, visually, it was um, it was extraordinary. Um, but in this case, you, you had the, the visuals, but you also had, you know, the temperature transients, the pressure changes, uh, the sounds. Um, it, was, uh, it, it was much more intense, and I'd say that nothing has changed in, from my perspective in terms of the beauty of Earth or what we need to go out and, and do and explore in the universe. Um, but I will say being outside, you definitely felt the sensation that you are surrounded by a very, a very harsh and threatening environment, um, which kind of you know, adds to the challenge and the mystery. And I'm going to pass it over to Cooper for her thoughts. Yeah, I completely agree with Jared. Just there's kind of the full body sensation of what you're going through. It's not not just visuals. Um, I went out of the spacecraft in darkness, and so my experience was definitely different than Jared's for how much I could see of the Earth. Um, but it, it is really a, really was a full experience 
full immersive experience in a, a very threatening and hostile environment. Um, absolutely incredible to see the earth from that vantage point though. And Sarah, while I have you, uh, I got to ask, so uh, could you, you know, you obviously your EVA was completely during the dark. Could you see, what could you see of the earth and of space and stars? Or was there actually so much of a glare from uh, exterior lighting and the dragon lighting? Or could you actually, like, what could you actually see and make out out there in the great beyond? I could see kind of the edge of the earth. It was almost a, a glowing blue relative to some of the darkness of the earth, the rest of the earth. Um, so that was really all I could see from the earth. And thinking back, I, I don't know whether or not I saw the stars. I was so focused on the mobility aids and the physical tasks in front of me. Um, I will say my memories are just full of a lot of darkness. Wow. Uh, so what's this mean for the future? And I, maybe uh, Anna or, or Scott or whoever wants to answer, but what's this mean for the future of EVAs? You know, now that you've gone through these, you know, these uh, initial steps, what's it kind of look like going forward? What have you learned? Uh, what? Uh, yeah, I guess what's it maybe what's Spacewalk 2 look like if you had any idea right now? You know, I think this was just the first step. This was iteration 1.0, an incredible accomplishment to create an EVA suit and execute an EVA in out of Dragon. But there, there's a, there will be more iterations to come, and you know, I think there already are things that the team is thinking about to continue to expand on the suit's capabilities, continue to expand on like the training capabilities, um, and continue to learn so that. One day you will see a future iteration of the suit, perhaps walking on the moon or Mars. Wow. Uh, so uh, I got to ask, why? Uh, what was the biggest limitation in the in the timeline of of this EVA? You know, each of you spent uh, about two minutes, um, and yeah, again, Anna or or Scott or whoever wants to answer, uh, why ten minutes? What was the biggest limitation? Why wasn't this like a thirty minute or an hour long thing? And would you have liked it to been? I guess. Hey, Tim. I think we certainly would have uh, liked to have liked it to have been longer, but we also knew that you know we had a very specific set of tasks that we needed to get through and then come back in. You know, SpaceX's kind of iterative design philosophy is you know you take these in you know small steps, learn a bunch, get the data back, and then you know the next week later you have your 2.0 suit, and a couple months later you might have your 3.0. So um, I'd say that uh, probably our timing was limited a little bit based on uh, just the margin we wanted to protect for in the event uh, you couldn't repressurize the vehicle, you need to be able to still come home uh, pressurized in your suits from like the worst case to orbit. Um, and then uh, we did do a manual hatch opening, so I'm, I'm sure there was some consideration that it might need to be a manual hatch closure as well, and maybe uh, some additional time was allocated. But we still have to do our debrief on it when we get back to Earth, but I'll, I'll tell you, we got through all the test matrix, so from our perspective, we got everything we needed to accomplish. And Tim, just one point to highlight uh, the success of the suit itself. Uh, you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into the test and development of that suit, um, and it worked like a champ. Um, it was comfortable, uh, not to mention the training that we went through with the collaboration with NASA at the vacuum chamber in Johnson Space Center. All those sensations that we experienced going through that training were very similar uh, to uh, what we experienced on orbit. Uh, and that's just a testament to the entire team that contributed to this mission. Um, a lot of resources uh, were utilized to get us to this point, and we're just uh, excited about what the next chapter looks like yeah scott that's exactly what i was going to ask next uh, was there how was the mobility of the suits for all of you uh compared to the training uh how did it compare when it was actually in use was it uh, about exactly what is he trained or was it any different i would say he performed exactly as we expected from training um one interesting observation was when we were at a lower pressure and a lower it was really cool to be kind of uninhibited by gravity and how the suit moved. So it was easier to move the joints when we were early in the suit pressure cycle. And then as we got up to full suit pressure, it was really consistent with what we saw in training from a joint mobility and movement perspective. Um, I think the new piece, as we kind of mentioned, is the thermal environment around you where you could actually feel the 
air leave the spacecraft, you could feel the temperature changes as the hatch cracked and all the air um, rushed out. And so it's just really, really cool to, to go through the full pressure and temperature and changes that, that go along with that. Uh, I got to ask a, another question to Sarah quick about uh, the, the beautiful song that you uh, performed. Uh, I, I mean, I, my brain was just going crazy about how, you, how do you even qualify a violin for spaceflight? I, you got to run me through those steps. You got to run me through like, did it, how'd you, like, was it okay in, a, in the vacuum? Because it went through the EVA first. Or did you record it before the EVA? Or what was that? Give me the rundown on the violin and playing a violin in space. Um, you hit on a lot of the, the challenges we faced. Um, I had always wanted to try to bring a violin. Um, for our mission in particular, absolutely everything in the vehicle had to be qualified for the vacuum of space. And so we did have to go through qualification testing on the violin. We put an initial violin through vacuum chamber testing and then put it into toxicity testing to understand what had off-gassed from the vehicle or from the violin and what might come back into our atmosphere afterwards. Um, and then we had a flight unit that we put through a full bake-out cycle as well that actually failed at too high temperature. So this was um, a number of violins in that we were finally able to qualify it safely for vacuum. And um, it actually perfectly survived vacuum. We did some capture before and some capture after just to figure out how to play the violin. Um, but it was so, so special to have a violin up here and just um, kind of a traditional wooden instrument floating in a very, very modern spacecraft. Amazing. Um, I, I got to ask now about some of the, you guys have been just so busy with uh, experiments. And uh, I, I think the one that stuck out to me most is uh, it, kind of dealing with, with uh, disorientation and uh, and kind of a little bit of uh, the sickness that you might experience. Can you give some initial impressions on how uh, some some of the science experiments have gone, especially that one? Has there been uh, anything coming of that yet? So we still will be anxious to hear what the researchers gather from all of the data back here, back on Earth when we get back. But we have been collecting a, a ton of research. We definitely have been collecting information about motion sickness, doing some tests into the disorientations we experience, the sensations we experience, essentially, especially upon initially entering microgravity. But then we've been tackling a lot of other research, too. For example, um, Kit and I both yesterday did an inspection of our airways using an endoscope that inspected for different inflammation or changes that might have happened due to the microgravity. And then we also performed a, an ambulance in a box test, testing out different di diagnostic capabilities that a spacecraft can carry with it that would be useful on a mission to the moon or Mars, and that can route that information over Starlink back to Earth. So we've been learning a lot, and I'll be really excited to see what the researchers can reflect from all of this. Yeah, and I think I have one more little science question here. Uh, obviously, you guys flew pretty much straight through the South Atlantic uh, anomaly. Was there... I mean, I know you can't feel radiation or anything, but was the instrumentation picking up anything different? Was there any signs? Like, I know a lot of people are always curious about the Van Allen belts. Just did anything stand out at all differently? Was anything going uh, off on a chart or anything? Yeah, Tim, it's a good question. We do have a lot of uh, dosimeters on board to gather some of that uh, more specific data. Um, but I can tell you that um, for sure uh, we definitely saw reactions um, to the vehicle, but uh, it, it stood up incredibly well to it. Um, I think it went quite as predicted. And then um, we also do, uh, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the uh, light flashes that astronauts have reported seeing historically. I can't say we all saw them, um, but uh, one account would be something along the lines of like a meteor shower in your eyes when you close your eyes. So I'm quite sure it was there. Um, but we'll bring some of this data back and uh, and see what they think about it. Amazing. Well, guys, I'm gonna I, one more question, and then I'm gonna get you on your way because I'm sure you're still so busy up there on orbit. Uh, just just hit me with any other uh, surprises or, or th overall thoughts of how the mission's going and and what the you know it, whoever wants to speak about uh, what they're gonna be doing when they get home and uh, just the feelings and the emotions. It's it's all so overwhelming. <laughs> Yeah, I would say this entire experience has been uh, an emotional roller coaster, a lot of highs and lows, but uh, this mission has definitely been 
mostly highs. Uh, we've accomplished so much. Uh, we'll continue to check off uh, items to make sure that we bring like, as much research as possible today, you know, last on orbit. Uh, we've jam-packed with uh, science. We're going to dig in right now. Um, we're all excited to see our families, uh, so that will be a good uh, reuniting moment when we do splash down uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, and then it's right back to work to get uh, all this data collected um, so we can prepare for, for future missions. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for your time. Best of luck, and we'll be cheering for you the rest of your space flight. Congrats, everyone. Hey, thanks, Tim. We appreciate your time. We appreciate all you do as well, man, uh, educating the community and getting people fired up about the future of human spaceflight and exploration. It's, um, it's pretty awesome, and it's a part of the uh, kind of the obligation that we take really seriously, too. So we look forward to getting back and sharing our experiences with the world. So take care, man. And uh, Dragon to Ground is now unmerged. Uh, Tim, thanks a bunch. I think that concludes from Mission Control. Thank you all so much. That was a lot of fun. Wow. Honestly, I don't really get nervous for things, but for some reason, speaking to them while they're in space through like mission control at SpaceX was like super, I was like really nervous actually. And I normally don't get nervous for any interviews or anything, but it's just like the pressure was on, you know, and it's like, I don't want to mess this up. And it was just such a big deal for me that to know that there's people in space talking to me. And that was just a very big moment for me. So huge thank you to the crew for taking so much time out of their unbelievably busy schedule and to SpaceX for helping coordinate that and everything. Uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, again, just felt so honored and it was so fun. Now, I do have to say uh, a big part of obviously these Polaris missions and anything that Jared Eisenman does, he, he uses these missions as a platform for awareness. On this mission, he's again working with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which is just uh, unbelievable. The work they do is incredible. Uh, so we got to give them a shout out for sure. And I'm really proud of us, the spaceflight community and uh, the people that those of you listening here and that watched our stream. Uh, I, happened, I was in California at the time uh, for a family wedding and I had a, a stream from a hotel room. But regardless, we still raised, I think, over $6,500 for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. So thank you all so much for those of you that tuned in and donated. It was uh, incredible. So yeah, big, big deal. And I appreciate all the support. And so does Jared and the crew and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Absolutely amazing. Uh, for those of you that maybe this is your first time uh, listening, be sure and subscribe to Spacewalk Podcast. And if you're a supporter, be sure and look for the post where we ask, we solicit for questions. And then you can, we normally just answer a bunch of questions. It's just fun. And I just yab and yab and yab a lot while I go on like, you know, long three, four, five mile walks. So yeah, uh, subscribe, make sure to ask questions and think of good questions that tend to be halfway topical, but uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. And thanks again to uh, Polaris Dawn and SpaceX, huge honor. Uh, thanks for joining me on the spacewalk. That's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Catch you later. <laughs>